Hi, it's Johnny here from For Bomb Fans Only, and I'm here with Joe. Hello. And we are privileged um, to be in conversation today with an Olivier Award winning actor and Bond royalty, Mr. Julian Glover. Privileged indeed. <laughs> You're so lucky. <laughs> so, if I may, I'd like to start right at the beginning and ask you um, what got you into the business you into know, the to business. start with. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you've got a few minutes, have you? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was a schoolboy and uh, I just changed schools for reasons I didn't, didn't go into. And I lived in Dulwich and we got my, they got me, thank God, into a school in South London called Allings. Uh, a school which was named after its founder, Edward Allen, who was one of the great Shakespearean actors of Shakespeare's time. Uh, and he founded the school for poor boys in South London. Uh, it's now become Allen's and Dulwich College. It's now two enormous schools. When I went to it, it was still a state school, and uh, we didn't have to pay for it, which was lovely. And I was about 15, quite late in my education, and um, the young English master who had just moved there uh, from university, a man called Michael Croft, decided to revive the long-languished uh, custom of doing Shakespeare at the school for kids. It's a very good idea anyway, educationally. Anyway, um, and he decided to do a production of Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare, open air, modern dress, using the cricket pavilion as the uh, the backdrop for it and uh, the fields. And uh, and it was jolly good uh, in, in the end. And I'd never done any acting before. A very shy little boy, would you remember? Would you believe? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, he cast me as Mark Antony, which is an enormously wonderful part. I mean, you couldn't start off with a better part in Shakespeare. It's so showy and, and, and flashy and, and really great. And I, I did that, and it was, it was a wonder to me, uh, this new thing called acting. So that didn't do it. The next term, they were doing a production of a Gilbert and Sullivan Opera, and, um, which was another custom that they revived. And uh, they did a, one called Ireland Thane, which there was a character called the Lord Chancellor, who had a very famous patter song, sort of Danny Kaye number. And um, I did that. And for the first and probably the last time in my life, I knew what it was to hold an audience in the palm of my hand. And, and uh, I went home uh, inflamed with this and just said, I want to do this. And Instead of going, oh, my God, our son wants to be an actor. What are we going to do? They fell on my neck with gratitude because they'd found a 15-year-old who knew what he wanted to do, uh, which is even more surprising these days because no one ever knows what they want to do when they leave school. Anyway, and so they encouraged me to go to Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, which I did just for one year, couldn't afford the second year, did my national service, wrote a hundred letters when I came out, got two replies, and started. And that was the very beginning. And uh, after a year or so in uh, in out of London theatres like uh, Dutton's Holiday Camp in Skegness, which was where I met my first wife, now Dame Eileen Atkins, uh, and some repertory. I got into Stratford-on-Avon as a walk-on actor, uh, the, the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre, it was called then, um, now the RFC. <coughs> and I started there and stayed there for three seasons, built up to quite nice supporting, small supporting parts, and then off into the world. And, um, and here I am now. So that's how I began. <laughs> um, Julian, it's been said that um, you were considered for the role of James Bond. Um, did, were you actually approached, or was it, is it, was it just... No, it was an approach to my agent, which I knew was among others. Uh, they, they had to recast their bond. They hadn't at that moment got Roger Moore. Mm -hmm. uh, we, however, uh, I can't remember who the other actors were now, there were half a dozen of us, were well aware that Roger Moore had just finished doing The Saint, and Roger was terribly available, and Roger was terribly right for it. Mm -hmm. um, but we went in on, uh, and, and did a, a screen test, all of us knowing we probably wouldn't get it. Yeah. I remember being very bad in it, so I, I didn't deserve to get it. Okay. Um, but yes, I was a contender, and uh, there you are. I didn't, I just played a villain, which I didn't mind. <laughs> Would you have taken the role, do you think, of Bond? Which what? Of Bond. Would you have taken the role at that oh, point? Oh, God, yes, of course, yes. <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> 
I, I might have, well have made a mess of it. I, I don't know, but we'll never know, will we? Because I haven't been, haven't done it. <laughs> but I played a lot. Of, I got that part. I, I, you're going to ask me how I got it. I'll tell you now because it sort of relates to that. How I got the part in James Bond was that Cubby Broccoli's wife Dana, they were in England and they were up in Liverpool for some reason and watching television and they watched an episode of Doctor Who. How soon before we can start the next tests? The next one, Count? Well, no, I want to see it today. Today, Count? <laughs> yes, today. Count, I think this is wonderful work, but I do not understand this obsessive urgency. Time, Professor. It is all a matter of time. Which I was in. Um, and it's called City of Death. And it was a character who went all through history being different sort of manifestations of, of a human animal. And part of it was uh, being a very, very upmarket, modern man. You know, sort of person who smoked cigarettes and cigarette holders and drank champagne, frightfully smart. And, and, and Dana Broccoli uh, saw that and said, that's the sort of guy we want for the Bond film. And so that's, that's how it happened. So that's ruined one of your questions, because I've, <laughs> I've already dealt with it. <laughs> so throughout your film career, um, I believe you worked with four of the James Bonds in various projects. I think Sean Connery in Indiana Jones, Roger Moore obviously in For Your Eyes Only. And The Saint, and The Saint, and, and Randall and Hopkirk. Of course. Uh, Timothy Dalton in Wuthering Heights. Which Heart. one? Timothy, Timothy Dalton. Dalton. No, my wife worked with him on television in his very early days. Uh, and then I knew him through Vanessa Redgrave, who okay. he was going with at the time, when I um, played Anthony to, to her Cleopatra at the Globe Theatre. Yep. And yep. in the fourth protocol with Pierce Brosnan? With Pierce? Yeah. Indeed, yes. Also, um, oh God, what was that series he did in America, Pierce? Remington Steel. Yeah, I did a Remington Steel. Ah. At a time when... Um, uh, the dollar was having a terrible problem and a lot of things were coming over here because it was much cheaper uh, and they did one episode here uh, and I was a policeman and that was right next to the Albert Hall I remember in a thing they called Scotland Yard building about the side of this house <laughs> I don't know how they, they thought that was, that was appropriate but that, I did it <laughs> So before we focus in on, on Roger Moore, because we want to talk a little bit more about Roger, um, what was it like working with Sean Connery? Well, Sean, um, I really have known since I was 23, 24. Uh, there was a big series on, a very adventurous and never been done before, series on BBC um, of Shakespeare's history plays through from... Richard II through to Richard III, and um, there's a lot of plays, and they were done in 50 minute episodes, like a, like a soap, uh, with a permanent uh, a permanent cast who changed their characters, and also some stars who were brought in, uh, like Judy Dench, for instance. Um, and much to my annoyance, because I thought I was absolutely right for it, this bloody footballer from America, from, from, from um, Scotland, came in uh, and played it called Sean Connery. And uh, <laughs> he was absolutely brilliant, of course, <laughs> the part of Hotspur. And um, so that's when I first met him. And, and he, he, was, he was jolly nice then. He was much more raw, of course. He was a young actor and, uh, and footballer. As he really play I think he played for Arsenal, didn't he? Or was that Dennis Compton? I can't remember. Anyway... Um, uh, and we all liked him very much, and we admired his work, and you know, he's a terrific new star coming up. Indeed, we were right about that. And uh, uh, So when I re-met him, I think I re-met him socially. So, so, yes, I worked with his then-partner, Diane Cilento, at the Royal Court, and I met him a lot uh, during that time. He drove an Aston Martin, I remember. God, I was so envious. Mm -hmm. We all were. <laughs> uh, and uh, how are we doing for light? I see mm -hmm. the light's just suddenly gone. Is that all right? Do you want to start again? No, no, it's fine. Okay. Um, yes, and he's always been... Some, when, he, when I did Indiana Jones, uh, he was, as usual, really nice. Not overly charming. He, he didn't, doesn't lay it on. He just, he just is. He's, he's a naturally 
good social beast. Quite private, actually, quite private. But if you get under the carapace, he's, he's a very nice bloke to be with. Um, and now he's settled down with his, for years and years now, with his, his partner. And I'm told by my female friends uh, that he gets more and more attractive every every day he, he, he goes older. <laughs> um, if only we all had that quality. <laughs> uh, no, he's a, he's a great favourite, and uh, we laugh quite. We, we were quite friendly at one time. But obviously, you know, since that's... I don't think I've... I've heard, well, maybe I've seen him a couple of times since in Jones Jones, but he lives in America and I don't. And um, so. um, Christatus was quite different villain to what we'd seen before yeah. um, he was a crook really but he was a very nasty crook wasn't he? he he killed a lot of people to get what he wanted and he had a lot of henchmen around him a lot of heavy heavies and thugs um, how did you how did you approach the role and and think the beard was that was that a big thinking or beard? having the Chris Artis having the beard yeah how did you approach the role and Chris Artis doesn't have a beard he's got a moustache Chris Artis has a goatee beard did he yeah <laughs> He did. Yeah, he goes. When I think of beard, I think of Game of Thrones. I mean, <laughs> yes. that's, that's, that's a beard. <laughs> Absolutely right. Sorry, yes, of course. Um, no, that was, the, 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 they suggested that, and okay. I, I liked it. Uh, okay. It, was, it gave, gave a nice Greek look to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there it was in the script, uh, uh, and I had to justify it. And um, it depends, you know, what. The reason that one of the reasons that movie was such a good one was because they decided, as you've indicated just then, uh, to have uh, proper people as villains, people right, you could recognise as human animals, him. not someone with a hook on the end of his hand or a hat, which you know, or a cat or whatever. whatever. Proper hu human beings who lived in this world that we know of. Uh, that's because Roger said, I, "I'm fed up with." just press a button and that building blows up or whatever. Uh, so I, I want just Bond to be better at doing everything than anybody else, and uh, which is a fair enough thing. And so that meant that the, the villains, we didn't know which it was until halfway through the movie, uh, were real people like he was. So he could out-ski anybody, out-bobsleigh, out-shoot, out-jump, you know. And um, he could do everything better. And presumably he could make love to women in a better way than anybody else. <laughs> but that we will never know. Um, <laughs> I think it's assumed though, isn't it? Uh, that's a given with Get James Bond. Take me around the world one more time. Why not? Um, and I had to look at it as a human being. Now, what, what's, what, it's no good just saying he's a villain. Um, any more than Indiana Jones is, a, is essentially a villain. No one thinks they're a villain. Uh, even Hitler didn't think he was a villain. He thought he was scourging the world of these awful things called Jews. And um, <sighs> it's difficult to understand, but uh, it happens. And Chris Dassos was training and paying for, which is a very expensive business, this young woman to win the Olympics, the Skating Olympics, and which is a very, very big and concentrated job to do, and he had to get the money somewhere. He, he was a businessman, but not that ex not that good, and he chose the wrong road to get the money. You cannot just arrest him. You must find a different way. You may have to kill him. Does this discourage you? Huh? Just tell me where he is. I'm here, Mr. Bond of the British Secret Service. He did get the money. Um, she was very ungrateful, um, <laughs> except she's not. I, I met her quite recently. She's a lovely girl still. I've given up acting, you know, Holly, yeah. Um, and that's why he got these people around him to do, make sure that what he did succeeded. And um, indeed, he worked with the Russians, which wasn't a good idea, and a bit of that. And of course, he is to blame. But that was his motive. He had a... A, you know, he, he really did care passionately about that young woman, uh, about her work and her, her Olympic potential. And uh, that's what I, that was my main thing about thinking that's, that's he's driven by that. And um, so the personal gain is, I suppose, the kudos of having put forward a, an Olympic champion. Um, but it, the personal 
gain is rather slight, really. It's just a small one. It was an altruistic thing he wanted to do. But I'm not making him out a good man, but uh, it was an altruistic thing. And, and he put his heart and soul into it, and also uh, apparently a few bullets into people as well, So, um, which is what makes him into a bad man. I mean, in Indiana Jones, what would you do for the secret of eternal life? You know, well, yeah. you kill your mother. And, and it, it, I'm, I'm serious about that. You got that opportunity, and uh, so that's why he's a thing called a villain. But he also uses Nazism uh, as his uh, as his means of getting money. Mm. Uh, that's, that's the reason he does it. Is uh, I saw nothing in the script that showed that he was inclined towards Nazism. Um, he, he, he wore the badge and he was a member so he could get money. And um, that's, that's up, I mean, this is a generalised more, but playing villains, you've got, you've got to be careful about playing villains. If you just play, it's okay in pantomime when you're the Prince of Darkness or whatever it is, <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, acting. But when you're playing somebody who's a real person, you can't think of yourself as a villain. I mean, even... Well, I've met lots of people who play villains, and, and they all feel the same. You've got, you've got to find a, a centre in yourself. And with Game of Thrones, some people think I'm a villain, and some people think I'm not. Well, I'm bloody sure I'm not, because I know what was going on inside me. I was like I was, because I was determined to survive. And, uh, and I did. I survived a bloody good long time. Because I, I was jolly useful to them, but at the same time, not worth getting rid of. And... Um, Oh, that old fart in the corner. We'll leave him alone. What's the point? <laughs> it was only when I became part of that gang of people who, who Cersei wanted to get rid of that I was gotten rid of, and uh, that seemed to me quite logical. This pains me, my lord. Whatever your faults, you did not deserve to die alone in such a cold, dark place. But sometimes before we can usher in the new, the old must be put to rest. So coming back to um, For Your Eyes Only, um, <coughs> obviously it's two years today that we lost um, Roger Moore. Um, you'll see behind you, you'll see his memorial. Yes. On, on, the, table, on the table there. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, we've spoken to a lot of people who've worked with Roger. Um, we interviewed John Glenn previously and spoke yeah. to him about Roger and, and it seems that nobody has a, a bad word to say about the guy. We just wondered if there's no bad word to say, There's no bad word to say about him. No. I mean, we don't know in the intimacy of his home, of course. Um, uh, but having met his, uh, his penultimate wife, uh, who was a very vivacious Italian girl, as you know, <laughs> um, I wouldn't think he behaved badly. I think um, he was, it was an unfortunate union. And I'm delighted, I was delighted when he moved across, although it was a very difficult thing to do because she was her best friend, or supposedly so. Um, no, well, I, I can only add to all those other people you've talked to that Roger was a thing, really was a thing called a gentleman. And I don't mean that by that that he had heirs of a gentleman, he was a true gentleman. He cared about other people. He was interested in other people. He really was. Very funny. Very, very witty man. Uh, and would use that on the set to relieve tensions and things like that. He uh, always had, always had a, a, a joke on the end of his mouth, but not, he's not one of those boring jokers, you know what I mean? Um, people are, oh God, he's always got to do a joke. That wasn't what he was. He was just a very amusing man. I was I was told never to say bad things about myself, because it, you know the, 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 I'm always credited as a one eyebrow actor, uh, which is not true. I got two, <laughs> uh, and an extraordinarily intelligent, um, and had a great big knowledge. Of, of, I don't know what other things, but his knowledge of Shakespeare, uh, which I do know about, uh, was extensive and uh, his, his love of theatre and his regret that he knew he was not successful in the theatre. Um, he, he came to see me in so many things. He called me Mr. National Theatre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was lovely. Uh, oh, here we go, Mr. National Theatre. Come on, show us how to do it. <laughs> 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 uh, 
bless his heart. Uh, I'm one, he was one of those people who, when he was walking down the corridor and he didn't even know he was there, he was coming towards you, he started to smile and he didn't know why. And, and came Roger, that's why he smiled, because his, his whole thing emanated for a very long way. Uh, and his, his last wife was absolutely charming, and is absolutely charming. And his kids are very good, very good kids. And um, hardly kids anymore. Uh, we did, as I said earlier on, I, I think it was only two saints. Do I mean Randall and Hopkirk? Uh, it was another series he did. Persuaders? Hmm? Persuaders? Persuaders. <laughs> I did one of those as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd got to know him quite well. It, it got to the point with, with, the, with the saints and persuaders and all those. I used to say to the producers, don't, don't employ me for this part because everybody will know that I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I played so many of those. With those, I have to say, I didn't dig very deep, deeply uh, psychologically. They were just bad nuts and um, <laughs> just play that. And <laughs> <laughs> Let it pass. <laughs> um, you work with Steven Spielberg on Indiana Jones. Do you think there's always been talk that um, there's a bit of a relationship between him and Cubby? Do you ever think he was close to directing a Bond film, Steven Spielberg? Never heard it. Never heard it, no? No, that's a speculation which I, has never come my way. I should think it was discussed. Hmm. I, I, I wouldn't be at all. I mean, Cubby would be a bloody fool not to ask him, wouldn't he? Yeah. Um, you've got arguably the greatest director in the English language, sitting at your table, you say, interested in doing a Bond. <coughs> and it might well have been discussed. I mean, it's an interesting speculation. I don't know where you heard it from, but it's an interesting speculation. Yeah, but, uh, it's just purely speculation. No, as far as I know, nothing about that. Um, in terms of big film franchises, you know, I mean, Star Wars, <laughs> Indiana Jones, James Bond, Harry Potter, <laughs> uh, been Game lucky. of Thrones. Um, do you find... There is a different feeling working on a successful franchise as opposed to a sort of standalone film when you're sort of within well, that. Um, I suppose there is, uh, yes, uh, there is when you, you know it's going to succeed hmm. on some level or another. And I knew that, with, obviously, with um, Few Eyes Only, even though I knew that it was a, 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 they were going out on a limb with it, making it different. Um, uh, yes, there was a. Once I got past the last, the, the first, few, first few days, when I knew I was being auditioned, um, you always did in those days. And of course, in those days, there were rushes, and I had to go back to England before they came back. And and is he all right? And uh, so I was in uh, for two days. Um, well, glad I passed the test. Um, once you passed that, and I, I knew it was going to be a wow, and it was Roger Moore, and it was. Cubby Broccoli, you know, uh, that one couldn't fail. The great, w the great success I have been involved in, Game of Thrones, um, we didn't know when, you know, it was right at the very beginning, and they put all this money into it and this idea, and uh, the script read, interestingly, it read, uh, and so it was wor obviously worth doing, but we had no, we were waiting with bated breath to see what it was going to be like. And I have to tell you that. Um, when we'd done the first two two episodes, no, when we'd done about four episodes, they decided to show the crew, do crew showings of um, the first two episodes when it was all cut together and, and dubbed and all. And Isla and my wife uh, sat there and it, as it were, the curtain went up and the, the first episode started. And you may remember it starts with a big white wall, just dust the wall amazing first image and this little hole at the bottom um, which was you saw was an entrance because some people and some horses came out of it this big uh, and then gradually went and, and at that moment even though only about 20 seconds of the film had started Isla and I turned to each other and went wow this is going to be a triumph <laughs> A 
and you could, you just you could tell with that sort of imagination going on uh, that it was going to be, and it went on being more and more of a triumph, uh, and, and the rest is, as it were, television history. Um, uh, working on Harry Potter was was there uh, was nothing to do with that really because it was only a voice. Go, I think not. My sons and daughters do not harm Hagrid on my command, but I cannot deny them fresh meat when it wanders so willingly into our midst. Goodbye. I was very lucky that um, they kept on changing the text, so I kept on having to go back and do it again, um, which was financially very nice. You were Aragog. Aragog, the, the, the voice of the spider, yeah. Which is quite entertaining. When I go abroad and, I, and people talk about, abroad people talk about seeing that, and, well, you were brilliant as that spider. <laughs> and, and I don't want to say, well, actually, uh, the film is dubbed into your language, isn't it? Uh, so you wouldn't have heard my voice. <laughs> Let them think it. Let them think it. That's fine. If people will buy a photograph of, of Darth Vader's helmet um, uh, and pay for that, <laughs> they'll pay for anything. <laughs> now, what, what, what's another one? That I've been, I've, um, another big one I've done. Um, Star Wars. Well, Star Wars, yes. Uh, well, with that one, we knew that the first one had been tremendously successful, and we all knew... Damn right too, because it was mind blowing when it first came out. I can't. You're you're all too young to know the impact of the very first Star Wars film. It, it, after so many sort of vague attempts to do galactic things, which weren't really very successful, and, and uh, rather sort of tin cans in the sky things. Um, Suddenly, we got something which was so immediate and so original and exciting. Uh, so we knew the first one was an absolute wow. So we had every hope that the second one would match up to that. And in my opinion, it, it, got, it was better. <laughs> Beautifully directed by Krishna. And um, it, what it did was to use the, the information which it had uh, provided and garnered from the first one and put it into the second one. And that made it really rich. And you know, the force thing really made, meant something when, um, when it was used in the second film. And we, we understood that it was f f quite different from, but the same function as a god and, uh, and the fundamental belief in yourself and all that stuff. And uh, so that's why... It, we thought it's going to be successful, and it bloody well was, and we did feel that. We did feel that. I am your father. No. No. It's not true. What are your thoughts on the Bond films of today? And is well, there anyone in the business who you think would could replace Daniel Craig? Oh, that second question I have no. One equal to two. Uh, I mean, actually, two. Uh, yeah, um, actually, I'm a bit old to know those people now. <laughs> the people like Daniel Craig, who, who I think is brilliant. Yes. Considerably. Uh, the, the, when they started them up again, <coughs> as it were, uh, I think they're getting more and more mechanical now. Um, they are brilliantly done. I mean, you really can't. <clears throat> it's like Star Wars; they're brilliantly done. But I think they've become a bit of a habit now, and, and I, I can see the problem that the broccolis have got, which is you've got to do better with the next one. Uh, it's no, no good sitting back and thinking, well. And the golden gum was good. <laughs> um, I'm leaving it at that. You're not thinking that. I sure am, boy. Never heard of Evil Knievel. <laughs> and so that's why they do these strange tricks and turns around. Uh, I think sometimes they're much more interesting uh, because there are longer scenes of dialogue in them. Um, 
people talking mm -hmm. one to the other and really talking about it and what's happening, mm -hmm. what's really yeah. happening. I think Judy Dench is a triumph, um, uh, a, a wonderful replacement for that part. But then, of course, she's wonderful in everything. Uh, I don't know anybody who has a word rather like Roger against Judy. I mean, she simply acknowledges the finest actress we have, and so she is a great replacement. Um, I enjoy I enjoy watching them, but you know I'm very old and I've seen a lot of them and 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 uh, it's jolly difficult to really stir me up to. But the first time I was, the last time I was really stirred up was, in fact, the beginning of Game of Thrones, as I as I've described. Uh, quite a lot of things in the theatre still excite me, uh, which I'm very pleased to see. And that, as the theatre is my main area of work. Um, not that I discount films, good God, films are fantastic, and um, how lucky I've been. I mean, I really have been lucky. You know how I g originally got into the bon into the uh, the Star Wars? My Lord, the fleet of right the there Comstar lived Robert Watts, the executive producer of, of Star Wars, and later of Indiana Jones. Right there. Oh, wow. <laughs> and there now lives Robert Pattinson. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. When he's in England. Um, a little house in Barnes. I was in the garden one day mowing the lawn, and uh, when you could see over the fence, uh, which you can't now, he popped his head over and said, "Oh, uh, we're doing another <coughs> another Star Wars movie. Do you want to be in it?" And, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> and that was the beginning. I didn't have to audition for that. Then he put me up for the sergeant in Indiana Jones, which I didn't get. And I was, which I was sorry about, but I thought, well, okay. And then they cast Michael Byrne, who was absolutely perfect. Um, uh, and then suddenly they called me up and asked me to play Walter Donovan, and I couldn't believe it. And uh, well, I did believe it, so I played it. <laughs> It's entirely due to Robert Watts that um, <coughs> this later part of my film career took off. So thank you, Robert. Julian, for the role of Christatus, um, was there an audition process or was it pretty much you've got the role? And I was just interested, uh, a man with such a great career behind him, do you still have to do auditions yeah. for things like Game of Thrones and Harry Potter? Um, yes, very much Game of Thrones. I had written three times. And I only got in uh, by someone being ill. Okay. But fortunately, he's recovered. Uh, Roy Dutrice was playing my part. And he got very, very ill, thought to die. And I got the part, which was not a very nice way to get a part, but I got it. But then he got, he got better, and he had a smaller part later on, so that was OK. Um, yes, I have to audition. Uh, the people who don't have to audition are the really big people. Um, Obviously, Judy Dench doesn't have. Michael Gambon doesn't have to audition. And Michael, um, Ian McKellum, uh, those, and obviously those film stars uh, in America, uh, don't have to audition. And there are several actors you can quote on television who are very, very successful. They don't have to audition. But I'm still, I still have to go and do a reading or yeah. whatever it is for whatever. Um, but with. Uh, for your eyes only, uh, I'd, had a, I'd had a terrible time. Uh, six months of completely devoid of any work at all, uh, not a smell of a job. Uh, we were thinking of having something in the house and, and, as it were, sizing down. Well, although this is hardly a big house. Um, you know, getting rid of the car, we could do without that. And it's, uh, we were thinking of that. And uh, at one Morning, they said, can you get out to Greece uh, in 10 days' time? There's this film happening, a, a Roman film, with starring Anthony Hopkins to play this captain. I said, yeah, I'll play anything. Yeah, yeah, what, what? And they said, well, if you could go out and it's going to be there. And I, yes, 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 great. Oh, God. That was going to temporarily solve things. Uh, 
three days later, uh, on a Friday, Screen Actors Guild strike happened in America, and all movies were called off. So I was back in the doldrums. We'd already booked for my wife and my son to come out to Greece in a hotel there. Uh, uh, and uh, what do we do now? Could we pay the deposit and uh, all that stuff? It was a Friday, and my agent rang me on the Friday evening. He said, can you get down to see John Cleese tomorrow morning? Saturday, I said, nobody works on Saturday. He said, well, they're working on Saturday. They've got this thing going on in Greece. I said, what? He said, it's the life of Alexander the Great, and it's a sort of drama documentary thing they're doing. Uh, and they want you to be in it, uh, and, uh, I think. Go along and see them. And I went along and saw them, got that. And it was in almost the same location as the other film was going to be. Uh, and so my wife and, I went, and son went out, and I followed them, I think, three days later and, and joined them there. It was not a successful uh, thing to do, um, but it had its fun. Lovely actors like Robert Stevens and Ian Charlson were in it, and um, uh, it was quite fun to do. And in the middle of that, having been on my beam ends, my agent rang me to say they want to see you for the Bond film. I said, and they want to see you on Sunday night, Sunday in the morning. I said, I'm filming on the Saturday. I'm, I, I, there's no way I can get there. He said, well, do what you can. So I went to my first assistant and said, this is the situation. I haven't got it but they want to see me on a Sunday morning. So he altered things madly, so I only had to work in the morning. So I went and worked in the morning, only took my costume off, didn't take my makeup off or anything, and took a car, dashed it down to Athens and got a plane. Two planes, two planes later, Dusseldorf and Hamburg, I think they were. Um, I got into London at one o'clock in the morning. Next morning, I went down to the Broccoli's house, cross-eyed, um, and uh, there they all were, and uh, not just the broccolis. Uh, the costume bloke was there, the makeup bloke, the, the, the first assistant, the, uh, and the, the whole family. Barbara was there, and uh, Michael, and uh, Michael Wilson. And I'd just, I'd been told uh, he hates smoking, so I was a smoker at that time. I didn't smoke, I was a very good boy, and uh, we just talked, chatted away. And uh, then eventually Cubby and, and Dana went out of the room, and that's when the costume bloke, Tiny Roland, as he was called, no, Tiny Nicholson, no, Nickel, Tiny Nickel, said, they're talking about you now, Jules, and um, I can tell you you've got it. I said, how did you know? I can tell Dana's face. And indeed, they came in and then asked me to do it which was so satisfactory. It was a, here I am, half past 12 on a Sunday morning, and I've just got the Bond film. After all that year I've had a Bond film. Can't believe it. So I flew back in the afternoon. I was back on set on the Monday morning. I bought the whole crew a drink <laughs> <laughs> that evening. Of course I did. And uh, that's how that one came about. So it wasn't an audition, it was an interview. So that, as I told you earlier on, they'd seen me in this, uh, this Doctor Who. So I think they'd, all they wanted was to, a confirmation that their instinct was right. I didn't know why they'd asked me that at that time. I discovered later. So I wasn't acting the part I played in Doctor Who just for, for that interview. Uh, I, was just, I was me, and I'm, obviously I filled the bill. That was about I think I look quite nice. Isla made sure I look quite nice. Um, I don't know what I'd do without that woman. Oh. <laughs> what did I do without her? Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so, final question. Um, we recently interviewed John Glenn. Um, and I love John. <laughs> he's a really lovely guy. Oh, he's a um, lovely bloke, yes. But For Your Eyes Only was his first uh, Bond film as director. Yes. Um, and we just wondered what he was like well, as a director and to work with. He made quite sure that uh, you understood what the part was. Uh, he didn't research it himself, of course. He only had the script. And so we talked about what I thought the part was, and he confirmed or rejected, whatever. And we quickly flipped through the, the main scenes, to make not to me to read them, but to say, I think this film's scene is about this and about that. 
And while we were doing it, um, he was always a gentleman, a, a, a very, very considerate. Uh, I, I pretty certainly liked Atkins very much. He, I know he liked me. Um, I see no reason he didn't like the others. Uh, we had rather one rather troublesome person on the set, though, who I thought he dealt with terribly well and uh, difficult to do, uh, but he did it very well. Uh, and he would, he trusted his actors and would simply give them hardly ever emotional things to do, except to say sometimes you can wind this up a bit, or that's a bit too much. Um, but he never ever questions one's intention. Uh, on any particular line or any particular scene. And he was always complimentary afterwards. Well done, that was lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Which quite a lot of directors don't do that. They just say, cut, next scene. Uh, and actors are like, well, they're like most of us. They're like plants. We need the baby bio, don't we? Mm -hmm. Pulled on us and, and told we're good. Because that's what keeps us good. Uh, if, we, if we think, you know, we've got something to offer, that keeps us good. And I, I this is not because I think John might see this. It, uh, uh, I really loved working with him. And we had some lovely nights out in Corfu, lovely nights out, uh, completely relaxed, you know, metaphorically in shorts and sandals, and uh, um, lovely. Yeah, really lucky guy. Um, so on behalf of um, for Bon Pans Only, thank you, Julian. Thank um, you, it's been a great pleasure talking with you. Thank you for a wonderful performance as Chris Dartus. Oh, oh, I must oh. have watched you a zillion times in that film. So, um, More than I have then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask actually, do you enjoy watching yourself? Uh, not very much, no. no. I, I usually do, do watch it uh, to check out whether what I had in mind is, is there on the screen. And sometimes it depresses me and sometimes I think, well, no, that's right, that's what I meant. I think, think that's rather good. I'm, you know, I'm not falsely modest. Uh, I think I am a good actor and uh, it quite often shows on the screen. And... Uh, but generally, I, d I, mean, I think I must have seen P.I. as only maybe four times. Uh, and two of those are publicity showings when I had to go to publicise the film. Uh, I've got it in my shelves, of course, and uh, I make quite sure my grandchildren see them. <laughs> <laughs> Pappy actually has got a place in the theatre. My son, you know, um, last year played Harry Potter in the plays of that name. Yeah, you, you saw him? No, we saw him. Yeah. Yes, they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think they're better. It's better than the film because in a film you understand that they can do these wonderful tricks, and and you're excited by them, and there's an less than excitement of them. But on stage, when you're actually you're looking at two people talking to each other, and one person turns into someone else while you're watching it, not a film. It's not the end of Indiana Jones when I got all collapsy. It actually actually turns into someone else or someone goes off the stage there and immediately comes on there. Not a double. Not a double. I know that old trick. Uh, not a double. It was the same actor. Amazing. I mean, proper, proper magic. And my son did that for a year and it was exhausting but great fun. I don't know why I'm telling you this. It's not his interview. <laughs> Give him a nice plug. Um, I would like to ask actually, uh, Christos had a Greek accent. Yeah. Um, how do you go about doing accents? Do you worry about not getting it right? Is there oh, a lot of practice involved? Oh, yes, intensely. I'm just about to do a Tennessee Williams play. I start on Monday, Tuesday, uh, play in the West End. And uh, this guy comes from Nantucket, which is un very few people come from Nantucket. It's an island off California, off um, Boston. And it's a, well, Kennedy's had a house there. So it's, it's sort of like a hamster. It's a posh area. And the accent is quite unlike. It's posh American um, before they started to consciously do an English accent, which they sometimes do now. Uh, <coughs> and Leo Williams is playing the female lead. And she and I, uh, she's my granddaughter, and she, she and I have been working very hard for two months on getting that accent right. Mm -hmm. I worked very hard on it, Chris Nartos. And in Indiana Jones, I worked very hard on the American. Yeah. In fact, there's a nice story, if, you, if you're still running. Um, I'd, when I'd done a big scene in Indiana Jones, and at the end of it, uh, we were all terribly tired, but Stephen, this, is, this sort of thing is his wont, came up and said, bloody good, Julian. He said, you know, your American accent is, is absolutely perfect. Uh, you can't floor it. He said, uh, from this moment on, you'll never stop making American films. 
I've never made another. <laughs> <laughs> but you were pleased with your performance as Chris Artis. I know you say you don't. Yeah. You, yes, I was. I, I, he did. He did what he had to do in the film, and um, I don't think I overdid it. Uh, if I did, I apologise to people. But uh, I, I think he was a credible. As I said at the very beginning, he was a credible human being, mm. a flawed human being, and um, so fulfilled the brilliant opposition to um, to the the James Bond and also to the Topol, who you discover. Well, he's a wily old bugger. That character is a wily old bugger. You know, wouldn't call him innocent person, mm -hmm. but he didn't. He wasn't. He wasn't the the villain in this film, as it turned out, mm -hmm. which was a very nice twist. I, it, it, same in Indiana Jones. That halfway through the mm -hmm. film, you suddenly discover that this rather charming uh, Bane man is the bad one, and rather a nice thing to do. Can't do it again. We've done it twice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Once again, thank you, Julian, for um, my great pleasure. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your contribution to the uh, the Bond series. Well, good luck with it all. It's, thank uh, you. It's, it's a nice thing you're doing. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very you. much.